Hi, my name is Mike Gaben, and welcome to episode 19 of my KSP campaign. In this episode, one of these Kerbals will die. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I do manage to kill my first Kerbal of this particular campaign in this episode. Uh, and although I'm kind of flippant about it right now, at the time it kind of really did sort of bum me out. But... We have a couple of things to get to first, starting with JunkSat1. You might recall that uh, JunkSat1 was uh, inserted into this large retrograde orbit at the conclusion of the last episode, and I had this plan to uh, deorbit it back into Kerbin, to have it crash back into Kerbin to uh, get it out of there. Uh, I know I could just simply in the tracking station, click on it and delete it, but I don't like to do that. I like to deorbit things kind of in-game, so um, I want to deorbit into Kerbin. And unfortunately, uh, I don't have enough Delta V for that because my ascent was a little less efficient than what I wanted it to be, but I do have enough Delta V to affect its trajectory into the moon. And as you can see, I'm using Precise Node once again. I first used this uh, mod in the last episode to help me edit my maneuver nodes. I highly recommend it if you find dragging those maneuver nodes around manually to be a bit of a pain. What I particularly like is these plus orbit minus orbit buttons. Um, you know, and I know McJeb uh, is another mod that has actually um, maneuver node editing tools built into it, but it also has a lot of other flight assists built, flight assists built into it that I find um, Ah, too tempting to use, so I'm, I don't have McJeb installed. Um, I also really like these plus and minus orbit buttons, which moves the maneuver node forward an entire orbit or back an entire orbit. And though I have quite a bit of Delta V for this, I, I'm trying to do this as efficiently as possible. There is a, pl a place where um, my orbit, the orbit the JunkSat 1 is in, comes fairly close to the moon's orbit, so that seems to be the natural place to try and get my encounter. So it's taking a little bit of finagling, and I'm closing in on it. I definitely have my, I have my encounter now, and I'm just trying to turn that into a collision. A little bit of playing around. Oh, oh, there it is. Kabam. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use alarm clock. Uh, that's coming up in just over seven days, so I'm going to use alarm clock to set up an alarm. You can put in a little bit of a margin ahead of it so that you can, I'm going to give myself a 20 minute warning heading into this, so I have plenty of time if I have to do some last minute adjustments, so that's going to happen in about seven days, and in the meantime we can go on to some other things. Now you may recall from previous episodes that I've had some issues with stage recovery, which is a mod that when uh, Kerbal Space Program removes a craft or a stage. Um, it makes a decision whether that stage has been destroyed or not. And one of the things I'm noticing here is this DR velocity. This is the first time I've really taken a look at these settings. And I'm seeing this DR velocity 2000. And I'm thinking DR probably stands for deadly reentry. In other words, this might be the velocity that. If it is over that velocity, when Kerbal Space Program removes the stage, it will assume it's burnt up in the atmosphere, that it's traveling too fast. And I've gotten that message two or three times. Two kilometers per second is too slow. I'm sorry. I, I, I've That's well below orbital velocity. I brought stages down uh, with, with much higher velocities than that, traveling through the atmosphere. Um, you've seen videos of me doing it with no issues with overheating or things threatening to burn up or explode. Ah, that's too high, or too low, I'm sorry. So I'm going to change that to 3 kilometers per second. So I'm hoping that that will take care of some of the stage recovery issues that I've been having of late. And then I went over to the vehicle assembly building and decided to work on a vessel that I've been kind of playing with on and off over the last little bit, and that is Kerpalo 1 here. Now the mission with Kerpalo 1 is to take a scientist and two tourists on a flyby of the moon and hopefully, well it's going to finish off some tourist contracts and also do collect hopefully a whole lot of science. And you can see it's one of my, probably, oh uh, no, it is definitely my biggest vessel so far. Um, I want to draw a little bit of attention as far as its construction goes to the uh, struts. 
When you get these bigger vessels, they tend to get a little bit wobbly, and the way to deal with the wobbliness is with strutting. You can see struts going from each of those solid rocket boosters up to the rocket, and then you can also see behind there are additional struts that will stay in place once the boosters separate. And that's how you keep your ship from wobbling. You want to put those struts on as much of an angle as you can, um, and you'll see these the, uh, strutting becomes more and more important as you get into larger and larger vehicles. But the strutting actually isn't the issue with this particular vessel and what I've been having trouble with. The issue is um, booster separation. I mean, it looks great at launch here. I really like this look. But when we get to booster separation, well... Uh, yeah, they don't exactly come off <laughs> it's a bit of debris, and it's a little bit more than actually all the boosters crashing into each other. That that doesn't bug me so much, but if you look closely at the rocket, you'll see that I did lose a tail fin on that. So, I mean, they're breaking off parts of the rocket. Um, I don't like that. You know, on actual launch day, right now I'm in a simulation, so whatever happens, I don't care. But, you know, on actual launch, if it's going to take out a tail fin, it might take out an engine, it might take out a tank. Uh, so, I, I played around a little bit with different things. I played around with uh, trying liquid fuel boosters um, rather than the solid fuel boosters. A couple of problems with that. Number one, I don't have fuel lines unlocked yet, um, which allows me, I can't do the asparagus type of staging. And with liquid fuel boosters, um, the liquid fuel engines are quite a bit heavier than the... Um, than the SRV engines, and you don't get, especially in the atmosphere, a particularly good thrust or weight ratio with them, so it ends up just making it harder to get off the ground. Yes, that's why we got these solid rocket boosters, to give us that, that kick while we're in the lower part of the atmosphere. So I decided to stick with the SRVs, though. Decided to make a number of changes. Number one was to try and remove one source of human error that I've been having, and that is errors that have to do with the parachutes that are on the first stage. I've been messing up with these a number of times. Uh, one of the things I've been messing up with is forgetting to arm them before I uh, before I separate the first stage. So what I did is I set arming the parachute to the brakes action group. And then I got out one of these smart parts that senses the altitude and set it so that it will activate the brake action groups, which will now arm those parachutes, and it will do it at an altitude of 55 kilometers. And that will now happen automatically. So I don't have to rem try to remember to set the parachutes and arm them. They should do that now automatically. Now, as far as trying to get the SRBs to separate cleanly, the ideal solution would be to use some separatrons, which are small SRBs that are specifically designed to help you with stage separation, but I don't have those unlocked yet, so I'm going to have to come up with something else, and the, 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 the only thing I could think of was to reduce what it was that they were hitting, so I took off these large uh, tail fins off of the main stage. There's no reason for me to have these because by the time I'm working on just the main stage, I'm into the upper part of the atmosphere. I don't need this much uh, atmospheric control and decided to instead go with these really small basic ones, uh, use some eight times symmetry in there and uh, you know that just gives a smaller thing for those SRBs to hit so hopefully they won't get fouled up as easily as they separate. And then I used the large tail fins I just used four of them on the SRBs because while the SRBs are running, we are in the lower part of the atmosphere, and that should help um, with 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 attitude control on the way up without these tail fins getting in the way of booster separation. And then finally, the last thing that I did, and you may have noticed this, that after booster separation, the rocket's got a bit of a wobble to it, and that has to do with the gimbling main engine, which was overcompensating, trying to hold on to its uh, appropriate attitude vector. So that was a simple fix. Simply turn down the gimbling on that. If you notice that the engine's going back and forth too much and the sh ship is wobbling because of that, just turn down the gimbling on those main engines. That should fix that problem right up. Okay, so we'll just uh, run ourselves a little simulation and see how this guy's working now. And here we are rising up. It's looking good. Yeah, a little bit of a uh, little bit of a shimmy as uh, KOS is overcompensating a bit on the roll, but certainly more than stable. It's nice and stiff. But then comes the moment of truth when the boosters separate. 
There we go. All right. <laughs> okay, a little bit of explosions behind me, but what goes on behind me, I don't care. Uh, it looks like all the fins on the main stage are intact, and that's what's important. Some slight heating issues, but nothing to be concerned about. It certainly is tracking nice and true. You can see how reducing the gimbling on the main engine certainly has made a difference. No, this is, this is beautiful. I can absolutely live with this. So what we will do is we will put this guy into the building queue and we'll absolutely be revisiting this in a future episode. But for now, we're going to jump three days into the future where we have in orbit two Kerbals that are stuck. Lafia and Carol are in need of rescue, but thankfully, they're actually in two orbits that are very, very similar to each other. So we're going to attempt to rescue them in one go. So I am time warping and uh, I'm going to launch well ahead of the first of those two capsules. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch into a higher orbit. And being in a higher orbit, that means that I will be traveling slower. I'll, that will allow the first vessel, which is Glyphia, I believe, to catch up. And uh, then I'll be able to do a rendezvous, and then I'll do some orbital shenanigans to pick up Carol after that. And performing the task here is ComSat 5. And ComSat 5, you've seen before, I have not modified it in any way whatsoever. This vessel I used to get uh, Ribfelt a few episodes ago. And although it isn't modified, I did modify my KOS script. Um, I did a little bit of adjusting to it and made it so that I can launch into various altitudes. Before it launched always to 80 kilometers, but I added in an extra parameter. So now what I do is I enter in both a heading, which is 90 degrees, because I'm gonna go just east, and an altitude, I wanna go to an altitude of 90 kilometers. So I got, I go launch 90, 90, Brief countdown, and we're off on a nice sunrise launch. There we go, and the first thing you might be noticing is that I do not have a crew on this. There's no crew. Last time I launched Bob, I used this to get Bob some, uh, some orbital experience, uh, and I was originally going to put Bill, which has not, Bill has not been in a single mission, and he got bumped. <laughs> Bill got bumped. And uh, the, reason, the reason why is because uh, I needed the cabin space. This only has space for two, but it does have a Provo Dobo Dine core in it. So it is able to fly autonomously. So the idea is, you know, sorry, Bill, you'll have to get your experience some other time. So one day we'll see Bill actually do a mission, but, but not this time. And just to let you know, this mission is about to end in a spectacular failure. There is something I've overlooked. And it was something that was involved in launching this thing again without modifying at all from the previous time that Comsat 5 launched. And if you want to play along at home, you can pause the screen right now, take a look, see if you can find the issue. I'll let you know, at this particular moment in time, I thought everything was going great. I had no issues. Uh, I had no, no inclination that there was any issues at all. But I'm about to find out my problem very, very soon. So our target apoapsis has been reached, we've had main engine cut off, we're just waiting for 50 kilometers, there it goes, so our program will end, and there it goes, KOS script is now complete, I now have manual control, and I just wait, I don't have manual control, I'm trying to adjust my attitude and I'm not getting any control whatsoever, and the issue is I have no connection. Take over look at the top left there you will see there is no connection at all and I do have remote tech and the reason is is because I have no antennas on this thing at all it flew before because I had Bob in the capsule and Bob was in control now that it is relying on mission control for control uh, yeah this is this thing is dead it, 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 it has no control at all it was running fine while the KOS is running because once I it has connection when it's on the surface because it's connected through the launch clamps but, and then that allowed me to start the KOS script. Um, the KOS script ran, does not need a connection in order to run, so it runs the whole KOS script. Everything seems fine. 
but uh, now that the KOS script is ending, it's become apparent, no, this thing's nothing. So what I have here is an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. Uh, in fact, a very expensive ICBM uh, that is in a suborbital trajectory, and there is absolutely no way out. This thing is going to be destroyed. You can see here we're getting some pretty impressive heating on re-entry. Uh, yeah, all the vulnerable parts are up at the front rather than leading with the engine, which is what I usually like to do when I... Oh, 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 that was the uh, escape tower, I believe, or maybe a parachute. Oh! Wow, that was spectacular. Wow, everything's gone. Everything exploded. That must be, maybe, I guess maybe when the fuel tanks go, all that's left is the capsule. Yeah, <laughs> you see how the parachutes are all gone and everything. Not that there's anybody to deploy them or any connection I can use to deploy them. So, yeah, that's the end of that. Only saving grace, nobody was aboard. But then again, if somebody was aboard, this wouldn't have happened in the first place. Well, after that miserable failure, I really wanted to do something successful. And the Otter 1 was sitting in the hangar. So I don't have a mission for it. And I'm just sitting here in the interior waiting for that map to render. And all I want to do... I'm just going to fly over to the desert, collect some science, fly back. There's a lot of desert science I haven't gotten yet. And you can see that our pilot is Ribfell. This is Ribfell's first mission. We rescued him from orbit just a few uh, a few missions ago. So Ribfell's firing this thing up. Throttling up. All right. Lift. Lift. What? 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 It's, it's not. Wait, wait, wait. What? What? No. Oh. What happened? Well, Ripfell's gone. What the heck happened there? I I am puzzled. The Otter's been a really dependable plane. I've used it on several occasions. It's been a very easy plane to fly. I don't get it. Well, in an effort to try and diagnose the problem here, I put Jeb right back into the Otter um, in simulation mode. <laughs> I want to emphasize that. And we'll try and do another uh, takeoff here. So again, throttling up, getting up to takeoff speed. And again, that nose just won't go up. Up. No, it, it ain't going to do it. <sighs> but of course, this time uh, the pilot survives now that it doesn't matter. Wow. I don't get it. So let's go over to the editor and see if we can not figure out what the deal is here. Okay, so the first thing I want to check out here is where the center of mass and the center of lift is. And what? Squad! Squad, you killed Ribfell! You bastards! I'll just to explain what's going on here, I have not modified this craft at all all. The only thing that's changed since the last time I've flown this particular vessel is that KSP is upgraded. I've gone from 1.02 to 1.04. There were some aerodynamic changes. But I didn't think they'd be that dramatic. Oh my gosh. So what I'm going to do is I need to bring that lift forward. So I can put a pair of canards up here. That should bring the, that there. That's more of what I need. Oh... Alrighty, we'll give this thing a go once again. Again, we are in simulation mode. We'll see how this will throttle it up. I gotta be honest, I thought of simply going back to my last save here. Let's see if we can get this off the ground though first, and then I'll talk about it. There we go, no problem. There we go. That's the way this thing's supposed to fly! What the heck? Anyway, as I was saying, I, 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 I'm gonna just wipe my hands of that one. Ribfell's death is not my fault. That's squad's fault, as far as I'm concerned. Unless they expect us to check every vessel over on every upgrade. Well, second thought, maybe that's not such a bad idea. But anyway, and I thought about reverting back. But the issue was that the last time I did a save was before that Comstock mission that you... Or that Kerstock mission, I'm sorry, that you saw fail, the Kerstock 5. I don't want to fly another failed mission. And then I thought, you know, maybe it would be a good idea to kind of uh, let it kind of roll. A good lesson for everybody and all of us out there that when uh, squad does an upgrade, especially if they fiddle a bit with the thermo or with the aerodynamics, to make sure your vessels are all 
going to be okay. I will certainly be doing that in the in uh, in future. So anyway, I thought I'd give this thing a run. Jeb will have a little bit of fun with it. See if we can do some buzzing of the uh, Kerbal Space Center. I am not the most brilliant of pilots in the world, but uh, when I'm in sim mode, well, it doesn't matter anymore, right? So here we go. Let's see if we can get in nice and close to the space plane hangar. Come on, Jeb. Let's get there. Oh, we really close to the ground. Do a little buzz here. Scare the pants off of everybody. And oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm so weak, Jeb. Oh, dear. Anyway, uh, everything came out okay there. And again, Jeb survives, of course, because uh, simulation mode. If it was for real, he would have died. Anyway, uh, that's going to have to end it for this particular episode. Sorry for all the failures, and uh, hope to see you again next time.